Hey everybody, how you doing? Welcome back to the Noel Kassler Podcast, episode 83. I'm thrilled to be back with you guys. I've missed you. It's been about a week. There's been a lot of exciting stuff going on, a lot of politics in the news, and uh, I'm glad we can be back here and catch up. I'm thankful to all of you guys for all your nice comments, also all those folks who signed up for the Substack. I started that last week, and many of you joined. I very much appreciate it. I put a couple articles on there. I'll keep putting more stuff on there as it comes to me. They're just kind of like think pieces, extensions of the tweets, and some of the topics I talk about on the podcast, sort of what's on my mind at a more personal kind of, you know, word-oriented way. You know, I remember a lot of the pieces I used to read in Rolling Stone and stuff as a kid, and I like things that kind of, you know, they're somebody's opinion, but they're grounded in fact and place. You know, so much of what's going on in this country, I feel like needs to be told on a personal level. That's why I went down to, you know, Florida recently. I wanted to kind of be in the room and the the market, you know, the marketplace of of this conflict that's happening in democracy and uh, my sort of take on the big picture. So I've begun to address those things. I'm just getting started on the Substack, but if you want to join, it's Noel Kassler at Substack, and you can find the link on any of my social media outlets. So uh, let's get into it. You guys know last week I got a call that uh, when I was taping the show, I wasn't kidding. I said, that's the White House. I got to take this call. And I took the call. It had a great conversation with somebody down there and got invited down for a meeting that happened on Friday. And it was uh, a briefing, you know, it was a, it was a incredible experience and I was honored to be asked to be there and it was essentially a briefing with a lot of the policy directors in Biden's White House and a lot of the staff that you know that try to shape the policy and and their concern that the story of all the wins and the sort of benefits that Biden's administration has given the American people it's not getting told right it's getting drowned out and we know that, right? I mean, he's he's reduced the deficit by half in two years. You know, he's reduced unemployment, you know, especially among, you know, people of color, you know, Blacks, Hispanic, you know, Asians. They all have the record unemployment. You know, we have record insurance, health insurance for American citizens. We have all this great stuff that's happening. It's an equitable recovery, right? We have all this infrastructure and all these projects. And, you know, what I found was that all these guys, you know, that are heading up these departments under Biden's administration, the economic policy, you know, initiatives and the environmental policy, they're all aware that this recovery has to be inclusive, right? So Biden has one of the diverse, most diverse cabinets in history, the most already, right? So this isn't just like Ivy League white dudes, you know, giving you their scoop like it used to be. This is a, you know, his White House looks like America. And, and so did the group of people that I was invited in, you know, and uh, it was great to be a part of that because that's what it should look like. And that's the kind of scene I grew up in. So I was happy to to be there for that. But all these guys and when they were laying out their points would talk about how like the infrastructure planning for all these construction projects, these states, these funds are earmarked that they have to be diverse in their hiring. Right. So the money doesn't just get sent down to Louisiana and passed out amongst, you know, some good old boys construction company who's only hiring, you know, his cousin's friend. You know, it's spreading the wealth around and it's integrating it into the communities and the sort of, you know, more vulnerable minority oriented sectors that traditionally get overlooked. Right. In economic policy and also, you know, especially in in Republican policy. So that was heartening. You know, it was heartening to see that they understood the big picture, that there was a real human connection, you know, between, you know, the war on poverty, childhood poverty, right? And and Biden's going after that, you know, he's trying to put 
food in kids' bellies. He's, he's understanding that millions of kids in America are drinking out of lead pipes. You know, we have cities where they don't have potable water, right? In America, American cities and many of them. So all those dangers, you know, coupled with the environmental sort of calamity that we're facing and, and taking an honest approach at it, it was great to hear, you know, and, and these guys got into the nuts and bolts. These were policy wonks of the first degree, and I won't bore you with all the stuff, but, you know, interesting things jumped out at me, you know, like a lot of these bills say like the clean energy, you know, when they build those big windmills that Trump was always talking about would give you cancer and kill birds, you know, the giant things you see, like if you go to Block Island or something, you see them out in the water. They're cool. You know, they're not immediately like, oh, I'm totally stoked that was there, but it beats a nuclear power plant, right? Or a coal factory. Um, you get used to it is my point. And they are sort of somehow kind of architecturally pleasing. You know, they look like modern art. But um, those, those, you know, wind turbines, they, they take like 50,000 tons of steel to build them, right? And that's American steel. So the Biden administration is making sure that steel is coming out of factories in Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania. And they're making sure those factories that are now getting this surge in manufacturing are hiring diverse labor forces, you know, and that makes me think, all right, these guys are getting it right. These aren't just like, you know, windfalls for constituencies and the money doesn't get spread around properly. The whole thing seems to be holistic in, in the way that it's dealing with all the issues we're facing and it's dealing with it all at once. And, and to a man and woman that came in and spoke with us, they all said, look, we realize we have more work to do. You know, that was a theme I heard over and over is that they were humble in their approach, you know, and, and they realize how difficult it is what this country is facing, you know, and they're sort of sane, sober adults, you know, treating it with sort of science, you know, and, and pragmatic approaches and empathy and all the things that you want in government, 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 <laughs> right? You want geeks that care, as I always say, you don't, you know, Trump sort of, you know, benefited from this thing that it started a little while back, you know, W. Bush benefited, you know, it became like, who's the politician you want to have a beer with? You know, that's the guy you want to vote for. Not always. You know what I mean? I lived around D.C. enough to know, like, I want policy wonks. I want the nerd that I don't even understand half the shit he's saying, but I know he knows what he's talking about. That's the guy I want writing policy and sitting up for 12 hours every night and reading all this stuff and crunching all these numbers and facts and making sure every choice benefits all Americans, right? Not just the people that put them in office. And to, to simplify it, that's probably the biggest difference between the GOP and the Democrats, right? One cares about people and one cares about money and tax cuts for the wealthy and manipulating anger to energize a base that won't see that they're getting their pockets picked constantly from their elected officials, right? Rick Scott's running, you know, on a, a Medicare, like we're gonna cut Medicare and social security. He's the head of the RNC, the, the Republican Senate committee. He's the head of it. And he's like, this is our platform. You know, we get a majority, we're taking out Social Security. Rick Scott, the guy who stole 300 million, right? When he was head of UHS, a healthcare company in Florida, he stole 300 million from Medicare, right? And then he took the fifth, like 75 times in his deposition, had the company write him a golden parachute of a severance package where he gets like, you know, he got 30 million to walk and like five, six million dollars a year for the first five years. Like, it was just ridiculous. The guy broke the law and walked away from it wealthier than when he began. That's a white boy problem, right? That ain't happening to a black man in America, right? Or a Latino or Hispanic man or an Asian man. It's happening to a rich white guy because his cronies aren't holding him accountable for stealing. And that's pretty much the philosophy of the GOP right now. You know, keep the dumb hordes that vote for us ginned up on guns and anti-Semitism and racism, racism and let the good old boys fill their pockets. Right. That's Ron DeSantis's whole model. Right. He, he held off covid testing and, and providing vaccines to his people so he could get kicks backs from his buddies in big pharma, you know, with monocloidal monocloidal antibodies and stuff. You know, I've gotten into all that in the past. Regeneron. 
You know, it's a Terrytown, New York company. Okay, it's as blue state as it gets up here. Not really, but you know what I mean? The guy's screwing over the people of Florida to make money off the rich Yankees, you know, or get some of that rich Yankee money. So that's traditionally been the sort of GOP take on things, you know, and, and it's being answered. It's being answered with smart, energetic, young people, old people. You know, the one thing they got on Biden is that he's old. Well, you know what? So what? He's a little older. He's got experience, right? He, 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 got, he started working on Capitol Hill in 1973. I was three years old, right? We all know his story. He had just lost his wife and his daughter in a car crash. His two sons were in the crash, you know, and he went to work every day right? He took a train back to Delaware at night. So his kids got tucked in, you know, that's a baller. He's got decades on Capitol Hill. That's good experience. I'm not hiring him to be a quarterback, right? I'm not asking him to run a marathon and, and by those metrics, he's in pretty good shape for an older dude. But my point is that's their big, you know, knock on him is that he's older as if Trump is some kind of spring chicken, you know? And like when I got sober, there, you know, I had a lot of places to choose from to get sobriety and a lot of meetings to go to, right? And there's young people's meetings in downtown New York City and there's pretty girls and, you know, it's all cool people and musicians. And then there was like older, more conservative meetings with dudes that had a long-term sobriety, men and women that had been there for a long time, 30, 40 years. They'd been through a lot. They had wisdom that was hard won, you know, and, and, and came from life experience, you know, and, and Addiction is a deadly disease, right? You don't get it right, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, you're going to relapse and die. So the people around you, you want to trust. They really know what they're talking about and they give you good advice. So when I had that choice of what meeting to go to, I was like, I'm going to meetings with these older people. They got the wisdom. They've been through it before. I'm going to trust their advice, you know, and you can look at politics, politics the same way, right? We're in a life and death situation. You know, we're in a life and death battle for democracy. If the other side wins, it's game over, not just for those entitlements, as they like to call them. And they say that like it's a smear. That's your money. You earn that money. You know, I've been working since I was 15 years old, 1985. I've been paying into Social Security. I'm 51 now. I might come looking for that money in the next you know, 15 years or so. And I'd like to know it's there. And more importantly, I'd like to know it's there for you and the people that came before me and that your Medicaid is there and that you shouldn't have to worry about that stuff in your retirement and old age. It breaks my heart when I go into a CVS and I see like a dude who's obviously an octogenarian working a shift every day. You know, I get some of them do it, you know, to, to supplement their income, but you shouldn't have to do it in this country, right? And that stuff came out of the New Deal, right? That stuff came out of, you know, the stock market crash in 1929, which was Hubert Herver, you know, and the booming roaring 20s, which was a, the first sort of big case of trickle down economics, which the Republicans love to talk about. It didn't work, right? The economy crashed. And by 1933, people are living in their cars, driving around the country. Kids are in rags. Grown men are in lines for soup kitchens. Right. And FDR himself had grown up extremely wealthy, created the New Deal, social services, you know, packages designed to make sure you didn't fall below a certain line in American society, a certain level. You know, do you think the modern Republican Party would have voted for the New Deal? You know, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have. They would have killed it. And we're in the same situation now. Right. It's the same thing. Every single Republican voted against you know, the American Renewal Act or whatever. I always get it wrong. I like to say Recovery Act, you know, but the big infrastructure spending bill, right? Somebody will put it in the chat. Every single Republican voted against it, ARP, you know? Every single Republican voted against IRA, the, you know, Infrastructure or Inflation Reduction Act. They all voted against it and they're tagging Biden with inflation, right? So they vote against all these social programs. They cut school lunches for children. They want to go after social security and Medicare, right? They never show up for these policies and they vote no on these policies. And then they take credit for the largest as well, which is extremely annoying, you know, and we catch them doing it every day. Elise Stefanik just did it in upstate New York, district 21, 
She took credit for $12.9 million in rural hospital funding. It's an investment in rural hospitals in upstate New York, in the Adirondacks and the Finger Lakes and all that, you know, beautiful country in the great north, right? She voted against the bill and then is running on, look, I brought $12.9 million to my district. No, she didn't. None of them do. But then they take credit for it because they're assuming that their constituency is too dumb to know the difference. And if their constituency happens to vote red, they probably are too dumb, right? Not that they don't have the capability to learn, but they've been poisoned. They've been you know, hammered every night by Fox News and Tucker Carlson that inflation is Biden's fault. Inflation is a global thing. Our inflation is lower than the Netherlands. We're like number 10th on the list right now. It's a global phenomena. Newsflash, the world shut down for a year. That affected supply chains. That affected currencies. <laughs> you know, our, our dollar isn't doing bad. You know, England would trade places up with us in a heartbeat right now. Okay, so our numbers aren't even that bad. Yeah, there's inflation. It's a global problem, but it's not Biden's fault. He doesn't control that. And he literally signed a bill to reduce it called the Inflation Reduction Act that the Republicans voted against, you know? So you got to think of it in that context and you got to think about how these people are being so brainwashed that they're going to once again potentially vote against their own self-interest. They're going to believe in Elise Stefanik, somebody who said Trump was awful and then kissed his ass every chance she got because she saw it was her ticket to the big time. And she's going to hoodwink the rubes in northern New York State. <laughs> and my, I got a lot of family up there. I know that area, but I've been up there a lot recently and y'all are getting a little country. OK, I've seen too many driveways with let's go Brandon signs and too many of those big ass dumb pickup trucks and your guns and your hate. That's where the big shooter came from in Buffalo this year. You know, a white supremacist young man who's been raised on hate, hate that's being funded by the GOP. You know, Alex Jones and all this stuff. There's big money behind all this. These aren't outliers. These aren't just random wackos. Look at all these shows, Steve Bannon's War Room, all this kind of stuff. Look how well produced it is. You know, look at it in comparison with my show. I'm doing this on a 12-year-old MacBook, okay? I was on Joy Reid a couple of weeks ago. My camera was like blurry, <laughs> you know, because it's not about the money or the flash or the production value. I come from live TV. Like I could make that happen if I wanted to. I'm trying to give you the truth, honestly, as I see it. And this is one dude in his living room right? Putting up a podcast. They're not that. They got chirons. They got producers cutting clips. They're going viral every day. They're going viral on Twitter because we react to the outrage, which is part of the cycle of dysfunction that we're in and kind of the theme I'm going to get to. You know, I know it was policy heavy in the beginning, but I'm making a point, you know, and the point is like, the, the White House, you know, they told us the good news and they said, here's the bad news. We, we're, we suck at telling this story, right? This story is not getting out there of Biden's achievements. All that's getting out there is inflation and he's old, <laughs> you know, and gas prices, right? Because the Republicans had an organized, you know, cabal, you know, of misinformation agents putting stickers on gas station pumps all across the country saying, I did this, pointing to the gas price, right? And, and as a matter of fact, Brian, it's the third week in a, a row that gas prices have gone down. And Biden got screwed by the Saudi Arabians who are in bed with the Trumps. They just cut production, you know, to hurt him in the election because big oil, you know, oil and gas industry, they don't want a democratic administration. They don't want environmental, you know, legislation. They want to do business as usual. That's why they have Joe Mansions and Kristen Cinemas and Chaos Agents all up and down, you know, the political spectrum to get their way because they don't want to have to change. They don't want to adapt. They don't give a crap about the environment, you know? And there's a lot of people that feel the exact same way. You know, when I was down in Florida, I talked about this last week, but I was like aghast at how many giant mansions were sitting there with a giant super yacht, you know, next to its, its private slip. You know, the amount of consumption, conspicuous consumption, 
you know, is, is just normalized in our culture is disgusting, you know, and those guys, they're not even paying income tax, you know, I bet you most of those guys have their primary residence in Florida, as I said, and that's not where that's not the only place they're living. They're not down there in July, they're up in Nantucket. You know, I see the same damn boats everywhere. You know, so my point is the guys that are making money off of that, the one percenters, they want to keep that going. And that's what the GOP is going to do if they take control of the House, right? They're going to preserve Trump's tax cut. So that'll be $77,000 for the one percenters right off the bat. They get to keep, right? And they want to put it on the backs of the middle class and the working people. That's who gets taxes raised on them. That's who gets entitlements cut, cut, right? So that, you know, the billionaires can continue to consume and they've got an army sort of cheering them on because they're throwing them little pieces of red meat that are just basically racism and keep your guns and abortion, you know, and the Dems are baby killers. Do these people really not want their daughters to have the right to an abortion someday? I don't think they're thinking it through, you know? I grew up amongst a lot of these kind of guys and I've talked about it, you know, and these are, these are sons of sort of Reagan voters, you know, fourth generation at this point, Irish and Italian Americans, you know, whose great, great grandfather came to the U S they lived in the Bronx. They finally, you know, made enough and they moved up to the suburbs. And a lot of them brought a certain xenophobia with them that, that the Reagan era reinforced it reinforced, you know, the, the myth of the, the, the black man as a menace, right? As a threat to white society, they reinforced the crime. You know, you gotta escape crime and get up into the suburbs. You gotta get a gun to protect, your, protect yourself and your family. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. And, and Reagan, you know, and Lee Atwater coined, you know, minted that kind of politicking. That's where Trump got Make America Great Again from Reagan. And Reagan got it from a fascist in the 30s, a pro-Nazi wing here in the United States. So it's the same thing over and over. It's the oldest song in the book, right? Kanye just remixed it in anti-Semitism, right? Like he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's an idiot. And these other idiots whispered in his ear, say this stuff. And he thinks it sounds cool. So he puts it out there and it influences people. And you have what you had on Sunday morning where people were Nazis, people part of actual neo-Nazi groups in the Los Angeles era, area were hanging flags. You know, we're hanging signs over the 405 saying, honk if you think Kanye is right about the Jews. You know, that's disgusting. And that comes a week after Trump on Sunday morning on his little social media app put up the American Jews better pay up or else. He threatened him. You know, and I've been screaming from the rooftops at Trump's an anti-Semite. He called Jared the Jew. That was what he is the Jew here yet. You know, and Jared knew that and didn't want to marry into that family because of it. Not that Jared's any saint, you know, but Wendy Dang Murdoch was like, nope, you're getting married. This is a big global thing and you got a part in it. Shut up and do your part. You know, they wouldn't have naturally ended up together for a variety of reasons, if you catch my drift. Not that there's any shame in that, but, you know, they're not a natural coupling, you know, but she got to hide in the, or- hide in the orthodoxy. It helped her. She was a fall down drunk. You know, Trump's kids all have addiction, alcoholism all through them. There's no shame in it. None of them actually got sober. Don Jr. relapsed. He's a coke freak every night. We all know it. But Ivanka would get like carried out of weddings and stuff. She was a real mess. She became orthodox, had a bunch of kids, and it sort of, you know, keeps her dry. And uh, (laughs) probably in more ways than one. (laughs) But uh, all right, I'm getting off on a tangent here. But um, my point is, anti-Semitism is a poison. It's toxic. And it's responsible for all the great marches of fascism that we've seen in the last century and going back centuries. It's something that needs to die. And it keeps coming back because it's easy. It's portable for ignorant people, right? It makes people feel like, oh, no, it's a conspiracy. It's a global cabal. It's ridiculous. And the Republicans run it in their ads. Every other ad mentions George Soros. You know, it's a dog whistle. And you have these rabid anti-Semite fascists fascists like Michael Flynn and these guys pushing this stuff. And Stephen Miller, who's a Nazi himself, you know, who's from Jewish heritage, 
you know, and locking up babies and stuff. So Kanye spews this stuff, you know, last week or whenever. And now you see what you saw on Sunday. And thankfully, it's Tuesday. I'm recording this. And Kanye's lost all his deals. Adidas, Balenciaga, CAA, you know, his, his, his documentary. Everything has gone up in flames as it should. Because first of all, the guy's an idiot. He's always been an idiot. You know, I know he has music that means a lot to people. I've watched his concerts many times. I've worked with him many times. He's always been such an insufferable asshole that it wasn't worth it. His talent did not outshine how difficult and disrespectful he was to both production crew and fellow artists in every instance. He was clearly mentally ill, you know, and he, anybody who calls himself a genius, that's always a good red flag. You know, there's a lot of artistry. And there are geniuses in hip hop, many of them. Kanye is not really one of them, okay? That's a self, it's like Trump doesn't drink. It's a self-propelled myth, okay? So his myth has crumbled because he got pulled into that Trump world, you know, and he got fed a bunch of, you know, crazy talking points that he was just loopy and stupid enough to go out there and say, and now his world has fallen apart, you know? as it should be. There should be massive consequences and he should never have a public stage again, period. Done. There's too many other talented people. There's brothers out there all over the country making beats in their bedrooms right now that would crush Kanye. I promise you that. <laughs> and that's not just in hip hop, that's in rock and roll and whatever too. If you think that person you see up on the stage is so special, I promise you there's a hundred dudes that can play guitar as good as that, that you never heard of or write songs or sing. I've seen it. I've been in the business. I know it to be true. Okay. That's not to take anything away from the folks who make it. It just requires a lot of other things to make it. Luck being one of them, good PR being the other, industry behind you being the most important. And Kanye came around at a time where that still existed. People were still selling a lot of records, you know, Def Jam, you know, Universal. These guys got behind him, you know, there's money to be made, but there's no money to be made anymore because it's a damaged product and he's done. And we won't even mention his ass again on here. But uh, let's talk about the hate, right? Because the hate is what he was selling because he saw it as another product. You know, he saw it as a taboo subject like Yeezys, you know, and the problem with this stuff is it spreads like wildfire. Because ignorant people latch on to it. Even if they don't know what it means, it feels taboo. It feels dangerous to say it. You know, it's like the mentality of adolescent boys. And I was one of those. You know, I was a stupid punk kid. I would say all kinds of dumb shit that I didn't know what I meant, mean. You know, that I didn't know what it meant. Because I heard other people say it. You know, I was exposed to a lot of racist white people as a kid. It wasn't all egalitarian. You know, my mom was a good dude, but she hung out with people that were good people, but in the seventies would make stupid jokes about blacks would say awful things. And I would hear it, you know, and, and once or twice I would repeat those things, you know, and see the damage to cause when I said it to my friends and understand how wrong it was, you know, and how ignorant the adults were around me that weren't even really adults. They're drunk 25 year olds, <laughs> you know, those were adults in my childhood. My mom had me at 19, but, uh, you get my point is that you get exposed to this or you hear it on Fox News or you hear it on a podcast or something. And then you think it's cute to go out and say it yourself without really seeing the full picture, without growing up enough to realize how wrong it is, how historical it is, how damaging it is. Right. And sometimes you have to make those mistakes before you can become a, a, a true sort of ally. Right. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you, you like that and sometimes you get benefits from the hate. So you stay in that world and your fear gets reinforced, right? And that's where we're at now. Now there's money in it, right? There wasn't a lot of money in being a racist dumbass when I was a kid, okay? There wasn't YouTube. There wasn't podcasts. You know, if you walked around with a hood on your face, you were going to get your ass kicked if somebody found you, <laughs> you know? They hid. Now they don't have to hide. Now it's big business. Now you have Tucker Carlson, you know, talking eugenics on Fox News every night, which came out of Yale University, by the way. Ron DeSantis, his alma mater, Brett, you know, Kavanaugh, all these other wonderful people. Bill Clinton, too, you know. But uh, my point is, you know, that this sort of white nationalism has been married with big money and people want in on it. 
you know, I've said it before, but if you look at the numbers of a Charlie Kirk or all these freaks on the right wing, these well-funded freaks that have these daily shows with the great production value, because they're getting checks from the Koch brothers, they're getting checks from the Heritage Foundation, right? They're spewing this hate and they're making money off it. Alex Jones was making like a million dollars a day at one point, and he was attacking the parents of a school shooting victim you know, of a school shooting incident, Sandy Hook, you know, and now he's got to pay a billion dollars, thank God, but he had a good run and he's still not going to pay it. He's selling stuff off of that and he's getting money for it, just like Trump's getting money for it. You know, it's like a grift. It's an authoritarian grift, you know, and now it's being married with soft focus, soft focused fascism. I can barely say it. I came up with the phrase yesterday and my tongue has not adopted it yet. Soft focus fascism, the Carrie Lakes of the world, right? The Christy Gnomes, the ones that look good and sound reasonable, they scare me the most. Ron DeSantis kind of scared me for a while until that debate last night. He just looked like a short circuiting robot. I don't know if you saw it. Charlie Crist literally, you know, handed him his fat ass. <laughs> okay. He could not answer questions. He like twerked, his face got all twitchy. I don't know what that dude was on but it was not a well man. And it was not a tough guy. You know, all his commercials are like him looking like Top Gun playing off his military service, which was, he was a jag. You know, he helped them get out of torturing people, get out of trouble for torturing people. That's what he did, you know? But um, he, you know, when he's in a controlled environment, when he's a bully, like with the Martha's Vineyard stuff and he gets to control it, he gets to come off like a tough guy at his little press conferences. When he was under hot lights on a stage where he was actually questioned, you could see why he didn't want to debate and only agreed to one debate because he got his ass kicked by Charlie Crist. And Charlie Crist looked wise. He looked measured. He looked calm, right? He didn't rise to the occasion. He didn't let his anger get the best of him, which is what you want in a politician, right? That's what Biden has. Biden gets a little pissed off sometimes, but he's slow and steady, man. He's an adult. He's a father figure, right? That's what you want in a dad. Like when the stuff's hitting the fans, you know, you want the guy who's gonna calm down. This is what we're gonna do. Just stay calm. Here's what we're doing, folks. We're gonna get through this. That's leadership, man. You know, I don't have that. I'd be freaking out and screaming. <laughs> if I was on the stage with, with Ron DeSantis, I would not be as calm. I'd be screaming at his ass because I'm not ready, right? I'm not matured enough. And there's something about maturity. It's like I said, age breeds wisdom. You know, if you keep your heart connected to empathy and learning, you know, that's what you want in a politician. A guy who says, I've been wrong. I've learned. I'm going to do better. I'm going to help you do better. What else can I do for you? You know, that's what you want. That's humility. Humility is, is, the, is the key, man. Humility is like the gateway drug to enlightenment, right? Because you decide you don't have it all figured out. You get out of your own way. And that's where real wisdom can come through. You know, that's what we use in recovery, right? Humility and acceptance. Those are like the keys that turn the ignition that get you out of the jam because you get out of your own way. You let go of your resentments and your own ego and your own sense of superiority and your own anger, right? And afflictions, your hurts that you think are so important. DeSantis looks like a guy roiling in his own pain, right? He looks like a deeply disturbed individual who's being motivated by sort of anger and greed, you know, and a quest to sort of have power over other people. You don't want those kind of people in a public office. You don't want politicians that are posing with guns and smiling, as they often do, right? Every day I see another picture of Marjorie Taylor Greene holding up a big gun and smiling. I saw one of Kemp, or not Kemp, but uh, who's the guy in Texas? Um, uh, Abbott, right? Holding a huge gun and smiling. That guy's had more mass shootings in, shootings in his state than anybody else. He was holding like an M60 with a big beautific smile on his face. Like, why are you smiling holding something that's only designed to take life? You know, even in the best circumstance, you should have some awe over the responsibility and the power of a tool like that and knowing what it does. It ends the life of somebody or something that somebody else loved, whether it's your enemy or not. 
you're taking something off this earth. That's the kind of power that you want people using judiciously and soberly, understanding the weight of it, not smiling like it's a goddamn toy. It's not a toy. It's life and death. And it happened again yesterday. There's a shooting in St. Louis in an arts high school, visual and performing arts high school, high school in St. Louis. And a gym teacher, a woman who I saw a picture of her with her dog, just looked like a great person. You just look at her and know that's a good lady right there. That's somebody that somebody loved, that a lot of people loved, that gave a lot to this earth. She put herself in front of her students when a former 19-year-old, a former student walked in with an automatic weapon and high volume magazines, right? With a long rifle, like all these kids use. She put herself in front of her students and she paid with her life. She woke up yesterday and went to school to teach our children and did not come home because she lives in a state where guns run rampant and Republicans are in control and they don't care. And they think guns are something to pose with like a prop, right? St. Louis, the same place you had that white couple outside during the Blacks, Black Lives Matter marches holding their guns thinking it was cute and their little polo shirts and their fucking boat moccasins you know it's not cute right it's horrible it's horrible that that woman didn't come home last night and it barely made the news because we've become so numb to the horrors but don't become numb to it vote vote because the other side is telling their people hey Dems are coming for your guns, and that's enough to motivate these jerk-offs, right? And it's not true. Dems aren't coming for your guns. Yeah, we shouldn't have AR-15s freely sold and high-volume magazines. Nobody's coming for your rifle in your closet or your handgun next to your bed, which shouldn't be next to your bed. It should be locked up. But nobody's coming for that, and everyone knows it. What they are coming for is your Social Security and your Medicaid and Medicare and your kid's free lunch program, and your daughter's right to an abortion, and your insulin, they're going to put the, the power to control drug prices back in the hands of the pharmaceutical industry. How do you think that's going to work out for you? How did it work out for West Virginians, right? And people with epilepsy, when Joe Manchin's daughter raised the price of EpiPens 700%, and now people are paying, you know, close to a thousand bucks for something that, that, you know, should be a nominal fee because you need it to live your life. Just like insulin or Trump, you know, or Biden's trying to make it 35 bucks a pop. Republicans oppose it. They vote against it. They want the money to belong to the industries that pay them so they can have big boats and nice houses and live out in McLean. Well, the rest of the people suffer. That's what it is. It's a grift. The GOP is a grift machine that has found the perfect formula. You know, it's found a way to gin up hate and resentment and anti Semitism and marry it with these cultural issues like guns and abortions. And now you have Christianity at the point that it's like this, you know, it's married with Trumpism. And every time he gives a speech like he did on Saturday night, they play QAnon music and they all put their hands in the air. I mean, this has already been dangerous for a while, but we're sailing into such uncharted territories. You know, we're sailing into full cult like, you know, sort of fealty on the part of the GOP. And we're we have so much dark money in the process now and so many loud right wing, you know, media outlets that are poisoning the minds of voters. You know, uh. MSNBC did like a focus group and uh, you might've seen the video. It came out last night and they talking to all these people in, in, in Pittsburgh swing state voters. And they asked him about January 6th and the fact that Doug Mastriano was like on Capitol grounds, he breached the Capitol and took selfies of himself. And they're like, don't you think that's wrong? And they're like, well, he wasn't really in a bad part of the Capitol. And was it really worse than what Antifa did? And you know, the, the chick who got murdered was, you know, she was really a martyr and she was unarmed and no cops died. And Elise, uh, who was doing the interview, I can't think of her last name, Elise pushed back and said, you know, no, a cop died. And they're like, he died of a heart attack at the hospital. It was later. It wasn't because of the thing. And he shouldn't have been a cop. Like, what does that even mean? 
right? These guys had no empathy for a police officer who was killed and beaten to death by a mob and made excuses for it and apologized for it and made a martyr out of some whack job who was climbing through a window to break into the Capitol floor and was told to stand down and didn't, right? But that's how brainwashed these people are. That's what we're up against because it's like I, I used to say last year, you know, the Dems are kind of like a folk group singing in a church parking lot in terms of messaging, you know, and the Republicans are like Metallica, you know, it's like Slayer. It's like a giant PA that's coming into these brains all day long. And these are not smart, sophisticated people that are buying this stuff. These are the dumbass kind of types I told you about. I grew up with. They're fun guys to smoke a joint with and talk about a pickup truck, you know, or, or the glory days at the high school, you know, football games but they don't understand the minutia of politics. It's not their business. They drive backhoes, you know, they put in pools, they fix your drywall or whatever, you know, or they sell shit. They're not all like construction workers, but they're not people who've been, you know, sort of studying policy, understand how complicated and complex it is and why you have to pay taxes. They're people that you can throw a dog whistle at and say, you probably pay too much in taxes. The Dems are doing that to you, them fancy named people with the Ivy League degrees, you know, and they don't put together the fact that all these Republicans went to Yale and Harvard Law, you know, Ted Cruz went to Harvard Law, you know, Justice Alito went to Princeton, who's going to take away your daughter's right to an abortion. How's that going to be in 10 years when you send your daughter off to college and she gets pregnant, has to drop out as my mom did, who got pregnant with me when she was a freshman in college, you know? So they're not thinking it through, but they're reacting, you know, and reactionary stuff is like, that's, you know, I talk about sobriety a lot, but like when, when you get sober, you want to get to the point where you're not reacting to things, right? It's why you do a four step. So you're not acting out of your defects. So if somebody sort of harms you, you know, or, or you, you perceive, you know, a slight against you, you don't automatically give into that anger and go on the offense. You know, you sort of take your own ego out of the equation, you measure your tone, you have restraint of pen and tongue, and you're just like, you know what, would I rather be right or happy, you know, because you're trying to keep a normal equilibrium, you know, and there's a saying like, you know, even self-righteous anger is the dubious luxury of normal men, right? And you've already conceded you're not normal, right? You have a sort of malady, a spiritual malady where you can go way too far on the deep end with that stuff. <laughs> I'm only speaking for myself, but I can, right? So you sort of, you pull back and you try to see the big picture. And yet most importantly, you try to see your own part in things, right? Well, how was I wrong? You know, how did I contribute to this situation? Because that's the only thing you can really change. The only thing you really control in this life is how you react to things, right? You can't control what happens. You know, you can control your intentions and the next right action, right? You can control the avenue with which you sort of seek the wisdom to do the next right thing when something happens to you, you know? And that's a, that's a key spiritual sort of tool and lesson, right? You know, they talked about that in the Bible. The Jesus dude, right? Turn the other cheek. You know, what he was talking about was a spiritual principle, you know? Forgiveness. Humility it doesn't mean be a victim, right? But it means like sort of take the high road. And that's not always the case. This gets dicey. I don't mean when they go low, we go high kind of. That was good advice for a while. We need to get in the, we need to start slinging some mud back ourselves. But the larger spiritual point, like reacting from a place of love and compassion and empathy and understanding that the person who wronged you is sick and suffering themselves, right? They don't yet have the wisdom that you've been blessed with in many ways, you know, and if you react to it in a different way, sometimes you shift the whole narrative and that other person sees something differently and then they see the humanity in you, you know, and you sort of make amends and you come to a common ground. And, and when you do things like that, you build, build real bridges and real understanding, you know, and you make it a better place. You know, that's why all the great, you know, movements, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, 
right? This was nonviolence. This wasn't nonviolence because these guys weren't badasses. These were badass, brave men, you know, showing that love was the ultimate way to go, that nonviolence and love was the ultimate spiritual principle, and that the arc of the moral universe would always bend towards justice. It just takes a long time, right? And who has the courage to walk that walk, you know? Anyone on the path of progress, anyone who wants to make this world a better place, you know, and that's the opposite of what the GOP wants, because they don't want people recovering and understanding and developing empathy, because you can't manipulate people who do that easily, right? But people that are stuck in their own anger and looking for the next boogeyman and the next person to feel resentful for so they can get that a dopamine hit of anger that comes when you feel righteous and when someone else is telling you the other guy's evil and you all put your hands up in the air, that's Nazism, right? That's what happened in World War II. The Germans, you know, had been held down after World War I economically. They were poor. They were suffering, you know? Here's this angry little dude came along and told him it was the Jews' fault and he got them all riled up, all these big-ass German dudes, these, you know? All of a sudden, all these kielbasa eating motherfuckers were marching in the street and turning on their neighbors. And there was a lot more educated population than the MAGA guys are now. And they did it in a heartbeat. They murdered their fellow countrymen and they should never be forgiven. Anybody who's ever part of the Nazi party could kiss my ass forever. And the fact that it's back in the headlines that somebody else is trying the same play and it happens to be an ex con, you know, or not ex con, but a criminal from Florida in a diaper, who's a drug addict, who spent his adult years sexually assaulting women and laundering money for the mob. And now he's in control of 74 million voters, essentially, that are being, you know, weaned on anti-Semitism or, or you know, or, or fed on anti-Semitism and racism. How do you think that's going to work out? You know, with Stephen Bannon, you know? Mike Flynn and all these other reprobates, Roger Stone, you know, ginning all these people up, they're going to take to the streets. We already saw it on January 6th. You know, they're manipulating the same thing. It's authoritarianism and it's a worldwide problem. It's happening all over the globe. I'm not saying it to bum you out. I'm saying it because we always have to react from the place of empathy, right? From nonviolence, from taking the high road. Because the spirit is on our side. Love is on our side. Love always wins. Progress will win. It is a new day in America. They're the last bastion of hate, and they're holding on with their fingernails because they know it's all over with the changing demographic, and they've done nothing to rise and meet the occasion, right? They've been all white supremacy, all kicking the money back up top to the corporations and the wealthy 1% and giving the rubes some hate and a big pickup truck and the promise of an AR-15 and waving a fucking flag on the 4th of July, right? And they're doing it for some orange clown who just got like his eighth subpoena in the last week, who has to give his DNA, you know, in a rape case, which he's 100% committed. He's raped two people that I know, okay? And I've heard about about 20 or 30 others. He was, it was well known. He was a rich white guy. He had ex-cops on his payroll, so he got away with it. But he's a rapist, first and foremost, right? That guy's the leader of a party, completely without morality. He's cheating on his wife right now with the Alina Hobbs lawyer. Have you seen these pictures in the last two days? She's his new Melania showing up at him with her breast popping out of her shirt. It's disgusting. You know, it's a disgusting human being. He's everything Christians have always preached against. And somehow he's married to Christian extremism now. And they're having rallies every weekend, you know, and they're having Marjorie Taylor Greene and all these grizzled, gnarled freaks coming out of the woodwork, right? And then, as I said before, you have the soft focus fascism, which is now like the 2.0 version of this and what has me concerned, right? Because the Carrie Lake lady has said she's already not accepting the results in Arizona, right? And she's like, I'm going to be governor for life now. I'm going to be governor in eight years. She's coming with that same delusional hypocrisy. And she's in a state that eats that kind of stuff up. 
You know, Arizona is like a mecca for whack jobs that want to have a bunch of guns and live on a compound. Nazis and Aryans and all these freaks. You know, and they're standing in front of ballot drop boxes in masks with guns, intimidating voters, Latino voters, you know? It's scary. And you have a Justice Department that promised to protect voters' rights in free and fair elections. And they're coming out yesterday with a press conference on China. Not that that's not important, but that wasn't what we're looking to hear. What's next? D.B. Cooper? You opening the case again? Like, go after the fat dude who's trying to overthrow democracy, okay? <laughs> no offense. You know, we're all overweight. I did. You know what I'm saying? Go after the criminal we're all thinking about. We'll get to the China stuff later, okay? Everything in this country is made in China. Like, yeah, they inf infiltrated, you know, Hawaii or whatever the, you know, semiconductor factory. I get it. It's in espionage, but that ain't what we're thinking about. We're about to lose this country in two weeks if we don't show up at the polls in massive numbers, you know, but of course they don't want to comment on that because they don't want to be seen as to throw an election that dudes are lining up with voter intimidation on, right? They're gerrymandering these states. They're kicking people off of voter rolls. It is going to be wild on November 8th. And don't let that scare you away. Let it, you know, embolden you. Grab a neighbor, grab a friend. Make sure everyone you know votes. When you walk into a store, you know, ask the hourly worker, you know, when you go in to buy a sweater, like, hey, you voting next Tuesday? You know, do they give you time off to vote? Did you learn how to get a provisional ballot if they say you're not on the, the rolls? Because everybody can vote. Even if they, you show up at the polling place, ask for a provisional ballot. It's your right. And it's the most important right you have, and it's one you may not always have if you don't vote in this next election. You know, it's never been more important in my lifetime. You know, I'm 51. You know, if anything, if I came away from anything from the White House, it was that. You know, it was like being on an episode of the West Wing, too, y'all. Like, I mean, I got to, I got to go to Second Gentleman Douglas M. Hoff's office, and he's got this cool, like, patio he's in the old executive office building which overlooks the west wing and uh i stood outside on the patio with him and ron Klein, you know the the chief of white house chief of staff you know and looked at the washington monument off in the distance and looked at the white house below and vice president harris came out while i was standing there got in her suv to go off to a diwali celebration which is wonderful right and happy diwali to anyone who celebrates i love hindu path of devotion and all that kind of stuff. Amma has been one of my major mentors in life. So I love all that stuff, but I love that it was diverse and multicultural because that's the promise of this country. That's the DC I grew up in, in PG County, right? Before I moved to upstate New York in 1985, 84, the last day in 1984 to be correct, New Year's Eve, you know, I lived in a multicultural environment outside of D.C., you know, and we'd take field trips to the White House, you know, and we'd see all these big buildings and these lofty ideas, you know, of what this country could be and what democracy stood for. And then I saw Reagan, you know, I saw a guy come in, declare war on the poor, declare war on kids like myself, cut a free lunch program, cut the school lunch program. You know, I felt there was results. And then I came up to New York with the guys that I just described, you know, that are living in houses in the suburbs and all they're talking about, you know, is the others because they're hearing it at the kitchen tables at their parents' house, you know, black guys are bad, they're stealing stuff and they're freeloaders and unions are bad and all this kind of just sort of libertarian, dumbass, white resentment stuff that's always been around that's now in the mainstream. And I remember the difference, you know, I was like, these kids have everything and they're only holding on to resentment. Where the kids who had very little were holding on to hope. You know, maybe that's the difference. You know, when you don't have a lot, you have the future, you have hope. And that's what our government represented. And that's what I felt when I stood on that balcony. It was a beautiful fall day, crisp air, you know, a big challenge to show up there for me, right? You know, as cool as it is to do something like that. When you get asked for something like that, there's nerves, man. I'm still recovering alcoholic. I'm still like coming at things from feeling like not worthy or what am I doing here? And there I am, you know, standing next to the White House, being asked to help deliver a message if I can, 
you know, being shown, here's the information we have. If this helps you connect with your listeners and your viewers, help us because we think this is a positive story, you know, and we were already on the same page. It's not like they're giving me talking points I don't have. They were just, you know, here, if we can help you, you know, with anything, let us help you because we're all in this together. And that is the message, right? We are all in this together, right? And we want policies that lift all boats, right? We don't want to exclude people from the American dream because it never works out when you do that. You end up where we are now. But if we all move forward together, it's wonderful, you know? And standing there reminded me of, you know, the Obama administration and the story I've told you guys saw me live you know this story standing there on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial you know with President-elect Obama and his beautiful family sitting behind me and looking out at the mall and seeing as far as the eye could see you know a ton of people who showed up in 10 degree weather to watch this country make good on a promise you know that it could be inclusive that we could have our first black president you know that we could be all all be a part of this democracy you know, and, I, and I, I was standing there and I looked, I looked to the left of me and there was Sharon Stone, right, from uh, Basic Instinct. And I was like, damn, <laughs> Sharon Stone. And then I looked to the right. I mean, it was David Axelrod, you know, and I turned to David and I said, hey, man, I just want to thank you for your part in all this, you know, and he took my hand and he put his other arm on my shoulder and he goes, do me a favor, turn around. And he turned me around and we both faced the mall. And we, look, we were looking at like 2 million people going all the way back to the Capitol, the largest sea of people I've ever say, seen. And he said to me, he goes, I didn't do it. They did. And he pointed out at the people, you know, and I got goosebumps. You know, I got total goosebumps. It's like being in the West Wing because I could feel what democracy is in action, you know, and you can't stop that. Right. You know, as a Henry Miller said, a billion billion men seeking peace cannot be enslaved. Right. We got the numbers, man. We got the spirit. Let's do it. Let's use it. It is our power. Do not be cowed. Show up and vote on November 8th. Let's make it happen. All right. All right. I hope that wasn't too much of a rant. I wanted to get back with you guys. I'll give you some celebrity stories next time. And that's celebrity stuff. White House. Right. I'm representing. And listen, listeners, you guys were all there with me. I would not have been there without this podcast, without all of you guys that follow me on Twitter. I was very aware of that. And that's why I suited up and showed up because I wasn't walking in there alone. You know, I was walking in there as a kid, as the kid of a single mom who struggled in her life, who overcame her problems and addictions as a man myself who struggled, you know, walked in there sober, you know, head up trying to show up and do what I can. And you guys came there with me. I wouldn't have been able to do it without you. And, you know, happy to share any of it. I got some cool pics too. I didn't put them all, all over Twitter, but man, I got some. I'll start dropping them maybe on the Substack. And check out the Substack. It's Noel Kassler. If you like this podcast, the Substack is basically a way to support the podcast if you feel like you want to. It's always going to be free. There's no commercials, any of that stuff, no subscriptions you know, on the podcast or any of my content, if you want to say thanks or you want to support it, that's the way, the Substack. It's 12 bucks a month, 120 bucks a year. I'm going to always be writing stuff on it. It'll get better as it goes. But, uh, you know, thanks for being along for the ride. Thanks for listening. I love you guys. We're going to do this. I promise. Get out and vote. We're going to be partying in December or in November, you know, mid-November. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. This is episode 83 of the Noel Kassler podcast. Until next week. Oh, let me say one more thing. I'm going to take a road trip. I did Florida. I did DC last week. I'm going to go to Pennsylvania and I'm going to go to Virginia. I want to go to some of these battleground states and try and talk to these people. And I'll put some of that in the sub stack. I'll make some car rants and some videos, but I got to get out there in the mix. I got to feel like engaging with people and trying to change hearts and minds because that's how we really do this you know it's door to door man neighbor to neighbor reach out your hand and try to talk to the people you can and make a difference so i'm going to be out there doing some of that and uh, i'll take you along for the ride so until next week this is an old castler podcast peace thank you